tonight's show, we have one very special guest in a very special show. None other than the legendary Sir Ray Davis. Tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by one of the greatest legends of British popular music, a great songwriter, a poet, the lot, a man who has also specially prepared some wonderful spoken word pieces before his choices of music, the wonderful Sir Ray Davis. But before we meet him, let's enjoy this song from the Village Green Preservation Society box set... Bloody amazing, if I may say so. That sounds so ahead of its time that, um, I mean... Ahead and behind. Ahead and behind. I mean, what a fantastic piece of music uh, that was. Um, picture book, people taking pictures of each other. Um, that was one to keep the boys happy in the band. Yeah, they played that beautifully. Very distinctive sound that they had yeah. there. Very distinctive sound, an amazing bit of writing. Tell us about the Village Green... Pre what was the, Greenwich, the Village Green Preservation well, Society? Well, it was an, an emotional refuge. When I wrote the album... We were in the middle of lawsuits with publishing. Drummer had tried to kill the guitar player in the band. Oh, dear. Slice off his head. But fortunately, it was just miss. We went on a disastrous American tour. We were banned from touring America for five, four years. Hold on a second. Why were you banned from touring America? Oh, Jules, it's so complicated. You know what musicians are like. It was the first days of the Beat Revolution and the British invasion and... I think we we were so low down as being trouble troublemakers. Now, do I look like a troublemaker to you? Not at all. No. Absolutely, a man of complete reason, a gentleman. Um, well Until informed. I get riled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it was an awful lot of time because every, everybody else was going to America. You know, Led Zeppelin, Jimmy went to the, Hendrix went to America, tearing up the states, and we were stuck stuck in Britain. So. I, I withdrew into this world called the Village Green, which was like a refuge, emotional musical refuge, where we didn't have to make pop records. We could try different things, like the thing you just heard, and write about subject matter like phenomenal cats and bikers. And although you said that's not, but it sounds like a, it sounds like a great pop record to me, though as well. Really, I mean, I think it just inadvertently perhaps is a great pop record. In hindsight, it's uh, one of the first indie records. Thinking about it. If, if if you can bracket anywhere, brack, bracket it. There's nothing else. Nobody else was making anything like it, and uh, it, it didn't really make it as a record. But over the years, it built and built in, in notoriety, and people got friends bought the record and played it together, and it didn't get on the radio. There's a lot of a huge uh, body of work. Do you, when you're writing, is it something that you can't, you can't stop yourself doing? Do you just, are you just constantly writing? Writing something in my blood. It's in my DNA. I get up in the morning, I write, write a few ideas. Don't necessarily write a song, but I come up with a few ideas. Keeps the brain moving. And for me, I was a failed art student. And to me, it was a way of expressing my thoughts about the world. But the Village Green, because we thought we'd never tour America again, it could be our last record. I tried to mix up the music, had a bit of Eastern European umpa music. Yes, yes, I could hear a bit of that there. And also a little bit of English folk music seemed to be English, coming up. And, of course, Dixieland, which oh, yes. was a big influence on me. Yeah. I used to go to the Highgate Jazz Club when I was a kid and ended up in New Orleans, which is a great place. But going back to just going back to this thing, you see, I, I think it's it's maybe a lot of people don't aren't aware of this, but you know, at the time, like you say, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, all these people were being allowed into America to tour, but the true wild men of rock um, were was were you because you were too dangerous to be admitted in to the you know you thought too much of a risk to get into. Yeah, America. the concierge at the BBC said that as I walked in the door today. He said, "You're Ray Davis. You're too dangerous to be let in." Yeah, exactly. Until you walked up and saved the day, and then you're a fa friendly face. People recognise you and said, yeah. "No, let him in with him." It's all right. I'm with, he's with me. If you if you ran the world, would it would it be different? 
so different you wouldn't recognise it. What would you do? What's a couple of things that you'd... What, any? New... Everybody would have to get up and sing a song in the morning. No, I like the sound of that. That's a good law to bring in, and yeah. have a special programme on at 7am, which you'll do live. Yeah. And everyone sings a song. It's like doing gymnastics in the morning. Yeah, a bit like being in, in sort of Soviet, sort of Germany. A little bit Soviet, but yeah. what's wrong with that? Yeah, and we'll be, be doing sort of press-ups and jumping yeah, up and down yeah, and singing yeah. the song. And I like the sound of that. Now, you've chosen some records today, yeah. um, and uh, the first one um, is uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Art Blakey. And Lionel Hampton. And Lionel Hampton. Oh, right, yeah. Some great... Well, tell us, when, when did you first hear this record, and why did you well, have chosen there it? There was a singer in the, in the bad old days called Jazz Club. You know, BBC, for people who don't remember it, was the home service and the light programme. And you didn't get much pop music. And they had this very posh voice. And these are... Feelings I get from when I hear it. OK. A posh voice on the light programme back in the day. A show called Jazz Club. The days before pop and beat music ruled the airwaves. Thanks to Auntie B, we get our music rationed, drip-fed, a couple of hours a week. Then, Mr Posh announces the players on the record, like it's an Olympic final. The starter's gun. ba 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 Sounds like a row of teddy boys getting spruced up for a night out. Bebop, boogie and jive. Straight into that big riff. So big you can smell the machismo. Then, just as your tippy-tappy feet are taking you somewhere else, it happens. They take it up a tone. Makes you feel alive. Makes you want to write songs like that. Makes you feel like a winner. The champ. seek him here they seek him there this is jules holland and i'm delighted to say my guest this evening is none other than sir ray davis let's go back when did you first hear when were you, what was your first awareness of, of music when when did, when did you first notice music were you, did, was it being played in your house by your mum and dad or yeah it's like lots of families at the time around the piano a little upright, all the, all the guys, six sisters, they all play the piano really badly. Yeah. And, um, but it's enough to get us going. Everything from light, or, light operator to music hall. My mum had a favourite by a guy called Malcolm Vaughan called St. Teresa of the Roses, which, forgive the composer, is an appalling ballad. <laughs> <laughs> and she used to sing along with it. But early rock and roll, of course, bebop a So it came via the family. My first performing song was Temptation when I was three years old. You oh. came, I was alone. I sang, I brought the house down, apparently. I, I was bet. three years old. I bet you did, cool. When was your first exposure to jazz records? Because that, that's, there's, there's, like you were saying, I, you, there's always an element of traditional jazz in, in some of your yeah. writing, isn't there? Well, I used to go to a place called the Highgate Jazz Club, which was a youth club, basically, in Highgate Village when I was very young. But it, it came through my dad. My dad lo loved people like Big Spiderbeck. So he introduced it, albeit in a sort of very crude way. Then when I was at college, I, I played in a band it's called Dave Hunt Blues Band. A load of old mainstream players who got jumped on the blues R&B bandwagon. you got to learn this one now. Riff along with us and pick it up. You know, threatening me over my shoulder. Yeah. You know what musicians are like? Yeah. <laughs> In encouraging a young fellow. Yeah, and I was, 15, I was 15, he was about 45. A little bit of an edge, but uh, a great learning experience to, to learn, not from a textbook, not from going to college, but actually being on the floor doing it. Yes, and also that way, looking into the to the dance floor, or looking into the eyes of the people who are playing the stuff too, mm -hmm. to see what, what the response is and how they yeah. engage with it, I suppose, isn't it? Your next uh, choice of record uh, is... Um, Otis Redding. Otis Blue. Steve Cropper slimes his way into an old man trouble as if to say, this is taking you somewhere bad. Otis growls, but the real story is in the backtrack. Then Al Jackson gives us that rat dat dat, and Otis slips into the bridge, heralding those slightly out of tune horns with their strange dissonant voicing. Boom, da 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 da. Hit me. The underlying threat is palpable. Stronger than black power, tougher than the Ku Klux Klan, 
and proves that music can be more potent than any political doctrine. Yet, it's all held together by a bass player called Duck. Donald Duck Dunn. Duck Dunn, where did he come from? Why, he's a bass player. He's from Memphis, Tennessee. Otis Redding, chosen by our guest here this evening, one of Britain's greatest poets, great legend, songwriter, musician, band leader, author, actor, the lot, the incredible, Sir Ray Davis. Can I ask you a question? Please What, do. what does it take to be a band leader? Well, what does? What are the qualifications? What, what qualifications? You, what, 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 do you, what do you... What do you... Like being a prison warden. Is it like being a <laughs> prison warden? Keeping an eye on all the inmates. But what's a, a sort of prison warden like you get in porridge? Like sort of a rather... <laughs> the, which are you the, are the, yeah, the gentle, he, he, feeble one or the bully? He's got the keys to the yeah. asylum, but he knows he can't win. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, I think it's... Is it like being a prison warden? Or is it more like being a friendly... I mean, I suppose some, some military training does help. Uh, to yeah. keep everything in order, especially with a larger band, but mm. you also have to be full, full of kindness and compassion. And compassion, which I'm sure you do all the which time. Which musicians don't have. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 I think you have to be quite good at. at uh, you have to be able to read because you've got to read in bedtime stories and plump their pillows up. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of that goes on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have but to be the ones. Are, you're the man to go to. You're the man in the arena. Well, that's right. We, we, we live or die on, on our decisions. Yeah. You know. We we'll get the blame. Yeah. And, but somebody's got to leave every, lead everybody over the, 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 over, the, over the top there, you know, mm. and meet the audience. And they always come to you for the podiums. Yes. And, and maybe a fireside chat. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. You need, to, you need to have... Somebody has to have a vision, doesn't it? Because it's no good if you... You know, you have to have somebody leading it or the whole thing... You know, you can't have it done by sort of... A we, had, we had a great rhythm horn section, the Mike Cotton sound, you know, Dixie Lamb mm. player. And Mike always had to count it in. Uh, when I'm the, lead, I'm the front man of the Kings, can I count in? Oh, you need a band leader, right? Yeah, that's not your job. <laughs> <laughs> Did he do it with his foot? Did they, that's what the Dixie Lamb... Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, 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 oh. Bless him, I yeah. saw him the other week. He's still leading the band. Yeah, very good. That was another music. It was a, it's an interesting that it is a part of the of on the on on your records and part of your experience is to hear is hearing that sort of uh, New Orleans traditional jazz Dixieland sort of uh, sound. You know, yeah. it's, which I don't think you do hear on so many records. But it's but there's something sort of British about it. I, I suppose it, people took to that music here very well, much. Didn't I remember they? Ken Collier was a man mm. who went to live. Early jazz, he brought it over. Of course, it infiltrated into pop music via Lonnie Dolligan, who sang with Chris Barber. Mm. I think Chris is still touring. Yeah. And so it was a, had an impact on British music. We were not directly aware of it. I, and it's a, it, was it part of the blues thing as well, do you think? The tail end of the blues thing, mm. yeah. Cause that Although was... they'd never admit it. In, that, in, in, in the introduction to the Otis Redding song, which was brilliant, if I may say so, mm. to my guest... You're allowed to do that if you're the host of the thing. Uh, you mentioned that music was more potent than any political doctrine. Do you think... It, 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 does music have a great power? It, re it reflects the times, and it can't dictate the times, but it reflects the times. You know, at the time o Otis Redding wrote that song... Otis Redding was 24 when he wrote that song, when he wrote Respect. And I think he was only about 26 when he died. But you had the race riots in Selma, Alabama. Mm -hmm. You had all that sort of stuff with Angela Davis going on, the Black Power movement. Mm -hmm. So I think music can reflect the time, and reflect it, if it reflects it accurately, it's more powerful than actually say, describing what it was like to be there. In yes. The book. And that comes through with Otis, although I don't think he was directly a political writer. But it reflects the times. Steve, yeah. I worked with Steve Cropper, and he told me that he'd been standing outside. This is back when these records were being made in the yeah. 60s, standing outside the studios on the corner yeah. uh, with Otis, and a police car came around, and they said, what do you think you're doing? You know, because the white kind of black guy just standing together on a street corner. Yeah. And that's, like, not very long ago, 1960-something, you know, living living yeah. memory. But the description of that, the, but the music tells you about what people's 
I suppose is also the music is the people's going, face in, adver- the advers- in, in the face of adversity, the music I they come up with. people get the news. It's the one thing to get the factual news and then the other thing is what's going on in people's heads. And I think music did that. Temptation did it with Wall of Confusion, Reflects the Times, mm. which is more enduring than any, any history book. Baby, I feel good from the moment I ride. This is Jules Holland, and I'm delighted to say my guest this evening is none other than Sir Ray Davis. When you were almost like in a treadmill of having to release single after single after single... A treadmill, all day and all the night, real quick. They said, we, you really got me dropped, dropped off to number one, we need a follow-up immediately. I went to my publisher's office in, in Denmark Street, did the riff, do, 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 did it on the piano. He said, yeah, record it tomorrow. We did, we did a big gig in Birmingham that night. I wrote the song. We rehearsed it at the soundtrack and recorded it the next morning. So it's a quick turnaround. And then was in the charts. That really is quick. Yeah. That's an incredible... So hold on. So, so one was in the charts and the other one was written just as it's, as it's, like, it's not even left the charts. And yeah. out the next day. And it was on a show called Jukebox Jury, and Marion Faithful said, it's very similar to their first hit. I said, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but who else might have you been listening to? Righteous Brothers? Yeah, well, I've got a little piece. Can you stand to hear it? I'd love to hear it. Sitting in a car outside an Indian takeaway in Luton, just about to go for a vindaloo after the show, just about to turn off the radio when it... That voice sings, You never close your eyes. I sit transfixed, mesmerised by the layers of sound until it reaches the climactic chorus. Sod the vindaloo, pass on the poppadoms, but hold the lager. I have to hear it build and build. Then it takes us down to that captivating hypnotic bridge. Baby, baby... Slightly gay vocal, but still masculine at the same moment. A few months later, the Kinks play the Hollywood Bowl. We arrive at the sound check, hyping ourselves up. We can top this bill. We alight from our limo, cocksure of ourselves. Then we hear that monumental voice echo around the canyon. You never close your eyes. Bollocks. We have to follow that enormous wall of sound. The only way through it was to build a wall of our own. You never close your eyes anymore. What an incredible voice. You've lost that loving feeling, the Righteous Brothers. And you you, you said that you worked with them. So you, you got to America in the end then, anyway. But that show I was talking to when that little spoken word thing... It was the Righteous Brothers, the Birds, and the Beach Boys, Sonny and Cher, Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, with Ry Cooder on the guitar, mm. wearing an Egyptian outfit. And we topped the bill. Unbelievable. So that must have been quite, well, like you say in the, in the, in the little uh, poem beforehand, or the little prologue beforehand, you know, you, you know all that's going to be on, then you've got to follow that. So you've yeah. got to bigger, build, big, build a bigger wall of sound around yeah. yourselves. Just turn up to 11. But we were going through a real crisis. But I don't know if you ever, anyone knows that the Grand Canyon, the canyon around Hollywood Bowl is immense. It's got a great natural acoustic. And if you're going through turmoil in the band and you turn up at Soundcheck and you hear, you never close your eyes. I think, crikey, we've got to go on after that. <laughs> and then we get to the show, and the opening act's just finishing here. <laughs> Another band to follow. It's a great time, but a sad time for us because we got banned after that. Your, your touring must have been quite extraordinary back in those days, really. I mean... Oh, and our road manager quit. And our manager ran off with the band, and so we were left to kind of... He ran off with another band? Yeah. Who did he run off with? Sonny and Cher, I think. Oh. But I did get a cover song out of it. I Go to Sleep, she covered that. No, it was more like the Wild West, less organised than it is now. The box set is quite a remarkable thing. I mean, there's a, 
a huge selection of amazing material. Uh, let's play something else from it. What should we play to finish off with? The thing is, so one of the problems with the record, I said uh, to the record company, I don't want any singles on this album. And I thought it was going to be the last record we made. So this song is a song of goodbye. It's a farewell and good friendship, a song called Days. And I recorded it recently, about seven years ago, in Denmark with the Stemp Danish Symphony Orchestra. And um, all my expectations were fulfilled. And another version. It's still the Kings, but with, with embellishments from the orchestra. It's great when you hear your... I mean, your songs have been done and covered by lots of different people over the years. What's the favourite cover of, of a song that of somebody's done of yours? I like the, the record. I like them all. There's a great version of, by a French singer of I'm Not Like Everybody Else a few years ago in a movie, a Tim Burton movie. So I like I like rec covers that bring something of their own to it rather than just copy it. Mm. You know, I like the Pretenders, Stop It Sub in that Nick Lowe record. That was great. Also Van Halen. It started. You really got me started uh, Van Halen's career, for better or worse. And um, so it's people who bring something of their own to it. I think that shows that I've left writing. In, can be definitive, but leave enough space for interpretation. And in so we're going to pl finish off with um, a different version of days because you've got the Danish Symphony Orchestra. Well, you're talking about what the qualities you needed, not the qualities you need to be a band leader are, but what the qualities that you need to sing with a symphony orchestra. Yeah, scary. Mm. Sing in tune and don't bump into the furniture. Yeah, it's a bit. But what is interesting about this version? You make one. You make records for the band, and you leave a lot to be, leave a lot for an imagination. On this version from Denmark, it's all my imagination fulfilled as well. What they what they created was what you were imagining. Mm, it was able in the arrangement I could do things I couldn't do with the band. It's not as good as the Kinks version, which is another another version. Have it, you know, cover records are. Great in that respect. They all have a different interpretation. But this, if I were a teenager writing this song, and I was, I think I was 22 when I wrote the song, um, it's everything I had in my head that I could take out on these poor musicians from Denmark. <laughs> it's been fantastic having you as a guest, I guess, this evening. And I'd like to thank you particularly for uh, your spoken in word introductions to some of those pieces of music, because I think that's... Radio Gold, and I'm going to suggest we try and get an Oscar or whatever the radio equivalent is. Well, we were first, man. There we are. Thank you very much for joining us. Sir Ray Davis. Thank you for the days Those endless days You're with me every single day Believe